Panie Ministrze, i mnie zapytujemy, kiedy Pan Minister opracuje normy zanieczyszczeń dla środowiska odnośnie zanieczyszczeń kazami? Można wyciągnąć jeszcze Ustawa antyodorowa powstaje. Na trzy lata, tak jak Pan Ja Ja powiedziałem, że... Could you please tell us what, what are your concerns? Pierwszy problem to jest koncentracja przemysłu szkodliwego dla środowiska. A więc fermy, przemysłowe fermy tuczu, zakłady utylizacyjne. Ja chcę czyste powietrze, żeby nie śmierdziało, żeby moja wnusia żyła w, czystości, w czystym powietrzu, zdrowo, tak? Żeby mogła żyć naprawdę zgodnie z przyrodą i żeby nie było korupcji, wszystkiego, tylko nie korupcji. I'm Tracy Worcester, and I've lived in the countryside most of my life. But whether it's in Britain or abroad, I've seen small family farms going bankrupt because of the arrival of giant factory farms. For years, I've campaigned against the destruction of rural livelihoods and to improve animal welfare. So these pigs have been foraging, getting rid of the bracken in a National Trust wood. This film is the story of my four-year exploration into the global pig business, a journey which goes from the UK to the USA, South America and Poland, to find out where and how pork is produced, who wins and who loses. But you'll be lucky to find any of this information on the label. Hey, look. Thick pork sausages. But you can look everywhere on the packet. There is no indication where it comes from. Though you can buy high welfare pork in some UK supermarkets, if you want to pay less for your high welfare pork while paying your farmer a fair price and keeping your money in the local economy, it's best to go to your local farmer's market. They know the quality of the product because we have a direct relationship with our customers. If they don't like what we sell them, they'll come back next week and tell us. For stallholder Mike King, the secret of producing top quality pork lies in the humane treatment of his animals. I think pigs, are, they're such intelligent, sort of inquisitive animals. They need to be active all day long, searching for roots and grubs and things like that. Whereas pigs in concrete boxes, um, they've got nothing to do all day long. They're totally bored. It's one of the reasons why I left that more intensive farming and, and decided to keep them like this. The intensive farming Mike referred to was pioneered in America and it's the way most supermarket pork is produced. Early in my inquiry, I met up with veteran animal welfare campaigner Tom Garrett, who's opposed intensive livestock production ever since it began. What we have, I think, is the application of industrial systems that were designed to build cars and build machines to living creatures. It's infinitely cruel in my mind, and no civilized society, whatever civilized society means, ought to countenance it. Sows, for example, are subjected to confinement in a very narrow cage, so narrow they can't even turn around during, during gestation. Workers in these installations cease to regard the animals even as alive, I think. They become habituated to cruelty and eventually they become genuinely brutalized. I believe such cruelty happens when pigs are seen not as animals, but as an industrial raw material. But the more I've looked into industrial farming, the more I've come to believe that it's bad for our food, our health and the livelihoods of rural communities. America's industrial pig farmers copied the chicken industry by cramming thousands of animals into a confined space. There are sometimes as many as 10,000 pigs in buildings like this, their waste dropping through a slatted floor. One of the workers I met told me what it was like working there. 
y, y trabaja uno um, 12 días y descansa dos. Pues lo que me ha afectado son los ojos y, y luego pues a veces quiere dar gómito. Eso es todo lo que, lo que a mí me ha... Over the years, scientists have studied the effect of working in these installations and have found again and again that they can damage workers' health. One man who studied the scientific literature is Dr. David Wallinger. The risks that have been most studied are definitely the risk to people working inside the facility. And there is an extensive amount of science that really goes into some detail about how a pretty large percentage of the people working in these facilities, whether it's hogs or chickens, will come down with chronic sinus infections, asthma, uh, bronchitis, uh, and other respiratory diseases um, that are related to this mixture that they're breathing in. The problems with pig waste are not confined to those working in the farms. I met Rick Dove, former lawyer and army colonel turned fisherman, who campaigns for clean water in North Carolina, where there are hundreds of factory pig farms. It's the way they get rid of their waste that's really most problematic. The, the hogs uh, dump their feces and urine on the floor. It goes under the hog house out to a lagoon. I mean, there are no beautiful women in bathing suits by any of these lagoons. But it goes out to the lagoon and then they slop it on the fields. And then it runs off into these drain pipes they have underneath the fields. It runs off into the ditches and it goes right down to our streams, creeks and rivers. And it's full of nitrogen. It's basically untreated waste. There are 10 million hogs in this small area and See, those 10 million hogs are producing more fecal waste each and every day than 100 million people. The first thing to realize uh, when you're talking about the gases that come out of a big confined swine operation is that it's really a toxic brew, that there's so many volatile gases mixed in with dust, bacteria, and antibiotics, and they're all mixed together in a very, very complex mixture of some three or even 400 different substances. So that's what one is exposing a neighbor or a family or a child to. During my research, I visited people who live near giant pig farms. They came out and tested my water, and in a couple of days, I got a letter telling me not to drink my water, don't bath them, my water, don't cook with it. And there's flies on the side of the house, all around the doors, all around the windows. Great big, greasy-looking flies. I have been to the allergy clinic for my allergies from this, trying to breathe. And it, it, it makes my eyes run, it makes my eyes puffy, it makes my nose run, it makes my throat sore. When it's spraying, you just cut your breath off and you get like phlegm in your throat, you, your eyes start running, you know, and you just get a headache, you know, and you just really almost, I guess, just get angry because you can't breathe. In 2003, when the US government introduced new controls on spraying pig waste, it was estimated that 80% of the farms in the USA at the time were in breach of the new regulations. And in 2004, a scientific study found that many older lagoons in North Carolina were leaking waste and contaminating the water table. Stop the Throughout the 1990s, small farmers in America campaigned against the growth of big farms. Food has become a major profit-generating commodity and has spread onto a global playing field where food producers Workers and consumers are reduced to pawns, manipulated by giant corporations. During the 1990s, large-scale meat processors bought up livestock farms. This vertical integration allowed the corporations to control the whole process from farming and slaughtering to packaging. The factory farms were now the main buyers of pigs. And as the price paid for pigs fell, many small farmers went bust. One survivor was Paul Sobochinsky. They wanted to control the market, and they wanted to control about how livestock production was going to be raised, and they wanted to take more of the profits from production and agriculture, take the profits the farmers made as independent producers and put them in their pocket. My tipping point, I think, was when I saw hogs go down to eight 
dollars a hundred weight in this country, uh, worse than the depression in the 1930s. And I saw that that pain. I saw that happen to farmers. That I knew that we had to fight back, that we had to stand up, or they were just going to roll over and take democracy, our freedom. Why is it when people are in bondage to their government, it is called tyranny, but when the oppressor is a multinational corporation, it is called efficiency. Of all the pork companies, Smithfield Foods of America is the world's largest. It processes 27 million pigs a year. It operates in 15 countries, employs over 52,000 people, and its annual sales are almost $12 billion. Smithfield Foods was a sort of regional piranha in the state of Virginia for many years. And then 1992, the CEO, Joe Luter, made his big move and built the largest slaughterhouse in the world, which actually takes over almost 300 hectares in Bladen County on the Cape Fear River. And with that, hog raising absolutely exploded, and uh, Smithfield went from being a piranha to a shark. In 2008, I went to North Carolina to see Smithfield Foods operations at their Tar Heel packing plant. 32,000 pigs a day are killed. It's a noisy, dangerous place to work. The workers have to work under extreme colds, extreme heats, for long periods of time, working on the line with knives and equipment, and uh, a lot of them are getting hurt. You know, I mean, recently, just you know, last week, a worker had his arm ripped off. We have people that are getting their fingers amputated by the machinery and the knives and stuff. The company has targeted the immigrant workforce because they, uh, you know, they understand that, that many may be undocumented and may be afraid to, to speak up when they're being violated, you know, or when the company is, you know, abusing them and stuff. So, you know, that's, that, to them, that's a perfect workforce. You know, workers that'll stay quiet and just do what they're told and, you know, work under any conditions. Opposition from farmers and environmentalists to the growth of factory farming had some small victories. In 2001, North Carolina banned processors from buying livestock farms, and also banned new build factory farms from installing the lagoon and spray system. Around this time, many agribusinesses started to look abroad. And a country to which Smithfield turned their attention was Poland destined to join the European Union, and a country where land and former state farms were relatively cheap, labor costs low, and regulations light. In Poland, Smithfield bought the former state-owned slaughterhouse, Animex, followed by 21 state farms. Its managing director explained why. We are in the farming business because we want to make money on it, yeah? and, and we believe that this has a great future. First of all, we are by far the biggest farmers in Poland. Secondly, we believe that Poland is a great opportunity for, for let's say, a foothold to get into the European market. In Poland, the arrival of big foreign factory farms coincided with a change in the law, which reclassified the definition of pig feces from sewage to fertilizer. This enabled the farms to use spraying techniques like this, common in America. No, raczej skorzystali ci, co używają dużo tej gnojowicy i to jest, powiedzmy, jeden z negatywów rozwoju gospodarczego w Polsce. In 2003, Robert Kennedy Jr., nephew of the former U.S. president, went to Poland to warn them of what he saw as the dangers of industrial pig farming. In 2001, he had filed a court case against Smithfield Foods, alleging that they'd broken environmental laws in North Carolina. He obtained a settlement in which Smithfield agreed to enhance environmental protections at 260 hog production facilities. I feel the responsibility to come here and warn Poland that they're going to try to get away with something in Poland that people in the United States now recognize is a catastrophe. The arrival of factory farming in Poland was controversial. The Polish Senate's Agricultural and Environmental Committee held a hearing to investigate it. They invited evidence from both Kennedy and from Smithfield. Adopting the Polish system of, of production to meet these challenges 
system requires capital inputs for the upgrade and modernization of both farms and plants. We produced in our country more pigs in 1918 than we do today, but there were many farmers sharing in the bounty of that production. 20 years ago, there were 27,500 independent hog farmers in the state of North Carolina. Today, they've been completely replaced by 2,200 hog factories, 1,600 of them either owned or operated by Smithfield Foods. Smithfield controls 85% of the hog production in the state. And every factory that's built gets rid of 10 traditional family farmers and replaces those jobs with two or three minimum wage jobs to workers who work in the plants. These facilities sicken the people who live downwind. Neighbors complain that they can no longer hang their laundry or sit on their porch during the summertime or plow their fields without becoming sick. There's now a moratorium on the construction of hog lagoons in the state of North Carolina. So here is a company that is coming to Poland and promising to modernize agriculture in Poland with a system that has been banned in the place where it was invented. In the same year that Kennedy visited Poland, a government report was published, which showed that all 14 Smithfield farms inspected had violated environmental, construction, health and veterinary regulations by failing to dispose of the waste, failing to look after their employees' health and safety, and the improper storage of dead animals. Uh, as in all companies in the world, we are uh, making mistakes, but we are not, uh, let's say, we are correcting the mistakes as soon as we make them. In 2004, I decided to go to Poland to see the impact of the new foreign factory farms and the lagoon and spray system on the Polish environment, rural life, and the quality of its food, which was destined for consumers all over Europe. I started in northwest Pomerania, where there are a large number of farms that used to be owned by the Polish state. The first state farm that Smithfield's Polish company Prima bought in 2001 was Boszkowo, which by 2004 housed 17,000 pigs. My guide, Marek Kreider, of the Polish Animal Welfare Institute, introduced me to one of the local residents. For many years before Smithfield arrived, they'd been complaining about their local groundwater, believing it to be contaminated. Could you tell me what specifically is the illnesses that people are getting around here? To z tego co ja wiem, to są tylko przede wszystkim dolegle ze strony przewodu pokarmowego, żołądek, poza tym jakieś zmiany na skórze. Also near Boszkowo, I heard locals claims of what had happened to children who had swum in the nearby lake. No takie normalnie po prostu takie jak odrzucenie czy coś takiego. Czerwone się robi, bo nic rapie się. I went to another village and heard about the smells. Here, another former state farm has been converted into a giant hog factory with 20,000 pigs on the fringes of a village. Locals weren't just concerned about the environmental impact of intensive pig farming. There was also resentment that people had lost control of their lives. Większość mieszkańców tutaj myślimy o tym, żeby użytkować tą ziemię, ale y, sami, z korzyścią dla nas i y, dla innych mieszkańców i produkując przede wszystkim y, zdrową żywność. Niestety nie mamy takiej możliwości, ponieważ firma Prima 
sukcesywnie wykupywała, dzierżawi, przepraszam, wszystkie grunty dookoła tej miejscowości, właściwie w promieniu powiedzmy nawet 20 km. Nie, my się z tym nie zgadzamy i to jest nie do przyjęcia, bo to są typowe praktyki monopolistyczne. monopolistyczne. Czyli te, te ceny na, nagle spadły na żywiec, nie? Do tego że nikt krowie nie chowa ani świnie, a pole stoi utłoki. No, tak jest, takie teraz no, rząd. To jeszcze my, to jeszcze jeszcze, ale teraz te nasze dzieci, to nie wiem co będzie. Łodły chapy udało ci być. nie ma nigdzie. No job. Wszystko bez robocie i te dzieci chodzą i muszą krać. No, wszystko chodzi i roboty nie ma nigdzie. Zapowiada się taka bieda, że będzie złodziej na złodziejuje. Okay. By now I wanted to see inside one of the factory farms. One person and no camera. Okay, why don't you want the camera there? I'd like her to follow and take a picture of the pigs inside the ventilation shaft. You stay from there, will you? Yeah, quickly before anybody comes. Unable to get an authorized picture of conditions inside any of Smithfield's Polish farms. A broken air vent was an inviting opportunity. The hard slatted floor deprives them of their instinctive rooting. Plus, there's no straw for bedding. I think we should skedaddle. Shall I run with that? Well, we don't want them to take our camera. Let's go. Let's leave. Though I wasn't able to film inside a factory farm, after a tip-off, in 2005, an undercover team from Compassion in World Farming filmed at a Smithfield farm, showing what was in the stinking cesspit they called a lagoon. Is there a bigger stick? Take them out. Smithfield responded to these pictures by saying it was physically impossible for dead pigs to get into the lagoon and they would never tolerate disposing of them in this way. And they also claim that local officials after an investigation concluded that the pigs found did not come from their farm. Later in the same year, another team from Compassion in World Farming managed to get inside one of Smithfield's farms at the village of Viscovice. Pigs in factory farms are usually raised on bare slats, but even on straw they don't look healthy. Some really lame ones in there as well. I asked Smithfield about these pictures, and they said that their pigs' health and welfare are their top priorities, and their Polish farms either conform to or exceed EU regulations. Although I've asked them twice, with regard to these particular pictures, they say that the allegations and the events described are absolutely false. Alicia Samley's farm has been in her family for generations. Nasza produkcja świń nie będzie się opłacała, dlatego że powstawają duże fermy i one produkują bardzo dużo świń. W krótkim czasie mają pasze z różnymi dodatkami, dlatego świnie rosną krótko, nasze rosną pół roku i dlatego nie będzie się opłacać, tak jak będą ceny spadać coraz niżej, to produkcja w ogóle nie będzie opłacalna. To właśnie się nie podoba, bo duże, duże gospodarstwa mają duże, im więcej hektarów, tym więcej dopłat. A lot of the European officials are saying that the Polish farmers are too small, they've only got 18 hectares. What's too small about that? If they want to sweep them aside, so... Uh larger operators can take over and everything will be eventually owned by the corporations, I think. And what do you think will happen to Poland as a result of that? If Poland's family farmers are exterminated, as it were, it will destroy Poland's culture and as far as that goes, its soul. So it 
it seems that economic development is not being determined by the needs of people, but by the need for companies to grow and compete in the global market. And believe it or not, you and I are helping to fund this. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, which is funded by governments, lent Smithfield $25 million to facilitate another $75 million from private banks. Smithfield benefited from a $100 million loan that was organized by the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development. This is taxpayers' money that's being applied to the expansion of Smithfield. We have a mandate, and this mandate is to uh, promote transition uh, in the um, uh, former communist countries. We are not driven only by financial profit, but because we are driven by trying to set the way, basically trying to have a catalyst effect. And in that way, you know, bring along with us then the private banks. The whole mission of the European Bank has been to industrialize Central and Eastern European agriculture. No question about that, and that has the effect of pushing out small farmers and independent farmers, and also the effect of opening it up to, to take over by foreign corporations. So the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development has government officials from 60 countries on its board, so it sets the development pattern. But for who? For you and I, the electorate, the consumer, or for giant corporations and the private banks that invest in them. I moim zdaniem to jest również przejaw pewnej nieuczciwej konkurencji w stosunkach międzynarodowych. Polscy rolnicy produkujący żywność znacznie wyższej jakości, lepsze, mają o wiele większe problemy i trudności z dostępem do łatwych, tanich kredytów na rozwój swoich gospodarstw. Czyli tu konkurencja nie jest równoprawna. Śmiem twierdzić, że ta konkurencja jest konkurencją zaburzoną. I wanted to find out who's driving this economic ideology which promotes big business at the expense of small farms. So I went to see economist Bernard Lietar, a former central banker and successful currency trader, now a university professor. The financial institutions are running the show. The governments are all indebted to them. In the United States, a third of all contributions to political campaigns are done by the financial institutions. So there's nothing that, there's no chance that they will change the rules of the game. I would compare the money system as a ring that we put through our nose. And it leads us where it wants to go. We forgot that we created the ring and that we put it there. So this taxpayer-funded restructuring and modernization effectively means the end to family farming, which produces good animal husbandry, good quality food, satisfying work, and protects the environment. When I revisited Borislav's Grodzic, he explained how powerless he felt in the face of the advance of industrial agriculture. We don't have any impact on that the company is hurting us. Na dobrą sprawę nie mamy gdzie się poskarżyć, że, że ta firma robi nam krzywdę. No, a to wynika tylko z tego, że ta firma jest duża, że jest ogromna. Gdyby ona była mniejsza, pewnie jej wpływy byłyby mniejsze. Właśnie to, to bardzo, bardzo dobrze to powiedział. To jest, to jest ta ogromna korporacja, która gdzieś tam przyjechała. Dla nas to jest dosłownie, to jest inwazja. No, to, to jest pająk, który siedzi na całej kuli ziemskiej. Widać w jaki sposób, czym jest ta globalizacja. To jest coś, coś ogromnego, które wysysa soki z tej ziemi, z ludzi. To jest taki ogromny pająk, pasożyt taki, który, który, który żeruje tutaj na nas. In 2008, Polish farmers were on the streets again. Będziemy żądali zamknięcia tych dużych ferm w Polsce, no i tego dzikiego importu. Oczywiście dzisiaj największym problemem w produkcji trzody chlewnej jest największa korporacja na świecie, jaką jest Smithfield Woods, który przejął polski animex w roku 99. 30% niżej cen kosztów produkcji dostajemy teraz. Czyli dokładamy z własnych kieszeni, żeby sprzedać, żeby utrzymać nasze rodziny, to musimy, nie wiem skąd, teraz musimy chyba jechać do Anglii albo do Irlandii zarabiać, wszystko pozamykać. Nie wiem, czy pójdę na emeryturę, czy się powieszę, czy co zrobię, czy wyjadę. So-called cheap meat from factory farms has flooded every market in the EU. 
And Smithfield has ambitious distribution plans for the UK. In 2008, its web page, using a bit of artistic license with a pig on grass, announced their aim to dominate, or in their own words, to be the preferred supplier to the UK retail and food service industry. To you and me, that's restaurants, schools, prisons, hospitals, etc. So I went to America to check out what Britain's supermarkets could look like. Smithfield, 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 Smithfield. Loads and loads and loads of Smithfield food dominating the pork section. This is the Walmartization and commoditization of every product. Smithfield is producing these uniform cuts, which is what, you know, Walmart wants it to do. And in the meantime, you know, they're, they're homogenizing and they're diminishing quality of life for everybody in this country. And I don't think it's good for America. It's not good for our food supply. It's not good for our food security. I wanted to ask Smithfield about their controversial lagoon and spray system, about their domination of rural economies and their influence on politicians. Hi, Dennis Tracy. How are you? Okay. Welcome to Smithfield. I want to say I really appreciate you all coming here and talking to us. I mean, I know that you may not agree with what we do, but we really take pride in what, what we think we're doing, and I appreciate you giving us the shot to at least talk to you about it. If you've got 10 million pigs, mm -hmm. and the research that I did, and you could question this, but that they defecate 10 times more than a human being, mm -hmm. you've got the equivalent of 100 million people defecating every day in a very small area. Surely we've got to understand that there's going to be a hell of a lot of people who are suffering from the stench and who's fishing and who's swimming in the rivers is going to be jeopardized by that system. The system is operated in a way that is not supposed to allow that. As far as things running off into the water, if that happens, that's against the law and it's wrong. Over applying this material to the field is against the law. Uh, uh, having it drift onto somebody's property is against the law. Uh, we go out of our way and go to extraordinary lengths to make sure that we have a system in place that doesn't allow that. My feeling is if the big uh, industrial producers, gosh, there's a whole bunch of them. I think Smithfield's the largest. But if all of these big guys uh, who have industrialized this practice were made to pay the full cost of environmental protection and disposing of their waste, any family farmer in America, any family farmer in this world, I think, could outcompete them at the marketplace. The destruction of the small farm wasn't casual, it's systematic. It's, it is the intention, it's the way that they make money, it's the design of this industry. Once a company owns both the slaughterhouse and some of the farms, it destroys the capacity of the farmers to organize and to form those cooperatives. And ultimately, it's the end of the independence of farmers, and they're no longer what we call farmers in this country, they're what they call serfs in Europe. Um, they are no longer in control of their own lives. You say that it's a natural progression that 20,000 independent farmers should go. Is it not related to the fact that you opened an enormous slaughterhouse and therefore could decide who you buy your pigs from? Well, you, could, you can argue that, certainly. I think the common misconception that a lot of folks have is that companies like Smithfield go into our conference room and have a big discussion about how we're going to dominate the market and, and run people out of business and then sell our wares to the marketplace, and that just isn't so. Uh, we are responding to what our customers ask for, which is large, large quantities of, of meat products in a very short period of time, and they want it... Sorry. And they want it in a particular cut, in a particular fashion. Uh, you're talking about the retail outlets. That's your customer. Yes, not, not the consumer. No, no, no. I'm talking about the customer, either the grocery store or the restaurant, uh, whoever it may be. Smithfield is one of the biggest food companies in America. And like many big companies, is a regular contributor to politicians in the states where it operates. You said that you're not trying to interfere with politics. And yet, you seem to give a lot of money to politicians who support your position. And they've changed the law to suit the pig industry's position. Political contributions are not common. They are the way of life 
in American government. It's part of the American system, which is know your representative, make sure your representative knows not only you and your family, but your company and your business, so that as they make decisions, they're aware of the impact of the decisions they're making may have on that company or that community or that person. I think it would be uh, if, I think if you ask any politician here whether they have been purchased by Smithfield Foods, their answer would be no. One of the few politicians never to have accepted campaign funding from any corporation is Dennis Kucinich. The problem with the American democratic system at the moment is that there's overwhelming corporate influence. It influences almost every decision made in Washington. It influences that we have continuing war. It influences that Wall Street has extraordinary uh, sway in Washington. It influences our energy policy, our tax policies. And only a constitutional amendment that would ban private money in public elections would save the country from drifting towards a type of uh, fascism that uh, is being visited upon us by large corporations who want government all to themselves. All of the great political leaders from the beginning of our national history have been warning the American public against the domination by corporate power. Teddy Roosevelt, who was a Republican, said that America would never be destroyed by a foreign enemy. But he warned that our political institutions would be subverted by malefactors of great wealth who would steal them from within. Abraham Lincoln, the greatest Republican in American history, said during the height of the Civil War, I have the South in front of me, and I have the bankers behind me, and for my country, I fear the bankers more. And Franklin Roosevelt said during World War II that the domination of, of government by corporate power is, quote, the essence of fascism. And Benito Mussolini, who of course had an insider's view of that process, said essentially the same thing. He said, he complained that fascism should not be called fascism, it should be called corporatism, because it was the merger of state and corporate power. And I don't think that, that corporations running the government of the United States of America has anything to do with American traditions. I don't call it the American way. The arrival of corporate power in agriculture in the UK has pushed farmers off the land and onto the streets. In 2008, pig farmers from across the country besieged Downing Street. We already know in this country we've lost 40% of the herd in the last 10 years. And I think if this continues and we don't get support, particularly from the supermarkets, then we're going to see another drop of, of equal proportions, maybe more. As our production has gone down, imports have gone up. And we know from all the work that we've done that 70% of those imports would be illegal to produce in the UK on the grounds of animal welfare. In most EU countries, it's legal to keep pregnant sows permanently in stores like these, although they've been banned in the UK. How can they possibly sanction pork to come into this country reared on lesser welfare standards than they force us to do? How can that be right? At the Oxford Farming Conference, I spoke to David Cameron, who, when in opposition, seemed to think it was possible to protect our farmers. Yes, we should be an open, global, free trading economy. That's what Britain has always been. But it should be on the basis of rules. And I made the particular point about animal welfare, that just as we don't accept uh, cars that uh, aren't meeting our emission standards, so we shouldn't accept the food that doesn't meet um, welfare standards. However, there's no sign of any restrictions on lower welfare imports from his government. It's particularly important to buy high welfare pork because of the emergence of antibiotic resistant bacteria, as explained by farmer Richard Young. One of the big weaknesses of the system is their heavy dependence on antibiotics and the fact that that causes infections which can spread from animals to humans, such as Salmonella, E. coli, um, Campylobacter, and even MRSA. 
And in the Netherlands, for example, where the most research has been undertaken, 40% of their pigs are carrying a strain of MRSA that can pass to humans. It's been spread rapidly on the pig farms because the antibiotics that are being put in the pig feed are actually selecting for it. That means they kill off the other bacteria which might provide some natural competition, but they don't kill off the MRSA because the MRSA is resistant. Meat which may appear very cheap is in fact very, very expensive and in some cases that could be at the cost of our own lives. We haven't had a new type of antibiotic, a new class of antibiotics for more than a decade now and it's very difficult to see that um, we're going to find new antibiotics that would have the same effect as ones that we've, we've had in the past such as penicillin um, which has saved millions of lives down the years. And there just isn't that level of research into finding new agents. So I think we have to be more careful with the ones that we have now and how we're, um, how we're forcing the evolution of these uh, strains such as these MRSA strains to become increasingly resistant to the antibiotics that we have. Because there won't be anything left in the cupboard in uh, a few decades down the line. Um, which may um, really point to a, a less intensified um, system of farming where body mass um, increases are, are not the, the train driver, it's not all economics and we are having a, a long view in terms of human health. Part of the puzzle is that people buy locally. And that is a very potent form of activism to say to the Walmarts of the world, we're not going to buy from you. We're going to buy in the local farmers market. You also need to sue the polluters. You need to demand your government enforce the law against them. You need to pass legislation that makes it very clear that they can't come into your communities and displace you know, the, the, the traditions and the values that your country holds dear. And all of us, you know, we had an American revolution in this country to, to, to create democracy. We need a new American revolution in this country now to fight against the corporate feudalism that we are now dealing with that is embodied so much by this industry that is eroding everything and subverting everything that we care about in our democracy. It's the same story in Canada, where one of Smithfield's global competitors, Maple Leaf, dominates the pork industry. Maple Leaf. Like Smithfield, Maple Leaf says nothing on the label about how they raise their pigs. These pigs are mostly kept on bare, concrete slats, with no straw bedding. The CEO of Maple Leaf refused to give me an interview. So, together with an animal welfare campaigner, I delivered a letter and my film Pig Business to head office, along with a bale of straw. Hello. The property line is, is right here. you got to be oh, okay. on, on this side of the property. Not a very genial reception. Hardly surprising, as they are still suffering the fallout from an outbreak of listeriosis in 2008 that killed 22 people and caused a pension fund to withdraw its investment. The animals need the straw. It's a, just something that will soften their life a little bit rather than these crates that they're in and the hard concrete floors that they're on. Straw is, is something that every animal deserves. Do you think that the corporate leaders have a responsibility to make sure that these animals have a healthy life? There's, there's just so many aspects to the whole production system of factory farms where you produce the most animals for the shortest time in the smallest space for the least amount of feed. All these things are focused on trying to make a huge profit when everyone is suffering. The environment is suffering, the animals are suffering. Health-wise, it's not good. So, Change needs to happen. It needs to happen sooner rather than later. As Canadians become more aware of the true cost of factory farmed pork, so farms producing traditionally raised pigs are increasing. But they say that unless you put them in crates, they crush their babies. Well, we've, we've designed our, our, our pig houses so that, that if you come and have a look at them, the back, the back side of the pig house actually slopes away, as you can see on that one over there. So the sow can't actually get under that piece, so the piglets can actually get in the back side without the, without the sows being able to squash the piglets. Could you tell me what sort of expenses the factory farms have that you actually save on? They have uh, energy costs we don't have. We don't, we don't have any lighting, we don't have any heating, we don't have any air conditioning, we don't use any of that. Uh, the other big cost is, for them is disposal of slurry, manure, antibiotics, things like this. 
Because farms like these don't have huge infrastructure costs, they're able to produce freedom meat for only 20% more than factory farms. And if I was a farmer and I say, I have very happy pigs, can you sell my meat? Would you make sure that I tick the boxes that you feel that you're confident your customers want to eat what I produce? That they are free from stress, free from hunger, uh, and locally raised. That is a big issue right now with wanting to support your local farmers. Uh, and of course, without the use of an antibiotics or growth hormones, that they're growing at their own natural rate. At the farmer's market, where the freedom meat is even cheaper, I met John Rowe, who buys all his meat from traditional farms. This is Tracy, <laughs> Terry. Hey, Tracy. And although she's a vegetarian, we're good friends. That's yeah. right. But also, why do you come here if you're a vegetarian? I come here because I know how they raise their animals, and that's really important to me. I live in a house of carnivores. So if, if I have to have meat in the house, I know that I have to know that it's how it's raised and how it's, it's killed. And, and I know their protocols. In Canada, it's legal to add antibiotics to the feed in sub-therapeutic, i.e. lower but constant doses, to prevent the onset of disease and promote growth. 70% of the antibiotics that are now produced are used for animal feeds. My goodness, I believe that antibiotics have a place. The problem is that they're less use useful than they used to be because we use them sub-therapeutically. Yeah. Basically, on our system, we, we, never use, we never use antibiotics, never. People are now so scared of what they're eating. They are worried sick about what they're eating, and I don't blame them half the time because why shouldn't you know what you're eating? You've got to know, it dictates how long you live. And I think the public needs to be aware of these things. They can see that uh, how, how differently pigs can be farmed. They don't have to be kept within buildings. These are probably one of the world's most intelligent animals, yet they're probably one of the most maltreated animals in the world. And I think it's just time that we respected them and gave them a bit of what they deserve in life and produce some good tasting meat.